Hello and welcome to the second session in this webinar series talking about the Zeta platform. My name is Daniela and I'm part of the marketing team here at ZetaScale. And today your host is Angelo Corsaro, our CEO and CTO, although most of you probably all know, already know you, so I won't introduce you any further. Um, and before we actually joined this session, before we came live, Angelo was just telling me how this presentation is actually brand new. So Angelo, would you say, because I can see all the people who joined um, this live session, and I can see some of them are Zettlers and Zeno fans that know us for quite a while. So would you say this presentation is for people who are new to Zeno as well as people who have been using Zeno for quite some time? Always, yes, because there we'll try to I'll try to dig into some of the corner that are a little bit less understood of Zeno and also provide overview of some new feature that are still uh, tagged as unstable, but actually they have already been used in uh, by quite a few users and we plan to stabilize as, as of the next version. So there will be some slides that you already know because you know newcomers need an intro, a proper intro, and that part I didn't want to change, but then uh, uh, quite quite a bit of juicy material for the, for the newcomers and for those that already know Zeno and perhaps want to get to the next level. Awesome. Before I let you start the webinar, just a bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comment section, which should be on the right side of your screen. And the slides for today's webinar are already in the handout section on the right side of your screen as well. Um, and if you missed last session, the slides for that are going to be in there as well. So with that, I won't take any more of your time and I'll pass the microphone to Andrew. Andrew? Okay. Thank you very much, Daniela. So thank you, Daniela, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's always, you know, for me, a huge pleasure to have a chance to, to make webinar. I like a lot to, to share what we do and um, you know, with, with such a cool community, such as the Xeno community, it's, it's even nicer. Lots of material to cover, so let's get straight to it. So Xeno, as some of you know, and for those that don't, Xeno is a slightly different beast than usual protocol, because typically, you know, and maybe you have used traditional publish subscribe protocol like maybe MQTT or perhaps DDS, uh, or you've used databases, right, where you can do queries. Well, Zeno, in a way, marries the world of, you know, data in motion, so pub sub and databases that addressed into a single and very elegant protocol, and in a way goes beyond what you can do with typical databases or typical pub sub. Okay, and as we will see, without needing to reinvent the wheel, because you know we have some great database technology, so Zeno helps you reusing those in a more distributed manner. So, in short, Zeno is a protocol that unifies that in motion, that addressed, and actually computation, as we will see, from the microcontroller up to the data center. Last webinar, we showed actually how to provision Zen infrastructure. Um, so, feel free to go back and look at it. Um, but here we will go a little bit under, you know, actually how do you program Zeno application? How does Zeno work and what are the primitives that it uh, exposes? Because you know, everyone understands the PubSub part, but the queryable, uh, it's like the great revelation. Once people understand how the query mechanism in Zeno work, it's like, wow, okay? Uh, because it opens uh, all the series of opportunity that would require you to use at least another two different technology if you were not using Zeno as a protocol. Okay, so real quick on this intro part, Zeno runs essentially everywhere. Why do we say so? Because the protocol was designed in such a way that it can run as low as a data link. As such, today we can run on top of a, of a serial um, link. We can run on open FedEx. We're working on supporting Canvas. But likewise, we can run equally well, and most of the time we actually run on top of IP networks. And that could be on top of TCP IP, UDP, we can run on top of Quick, and we are creating a custom transport which should be released as part of the next version for raw Ethernet, which is useful especially when using them in combination with time-sensitive networks or for, for some other application. The protocol is very efficient, only five bytes of minimal overheads, between five and six, actually. And I have, um, a, I think, a pretty throughout analysis of the protocol overhead that I presented at the last uh, um, Eclipse conference in Germany a few months ago. So in terms of OS support for most of your favorite operating systems, so Linux for sure, Mac OS, Windows, QNX as alpha, embedded target with support for Arduino, ESP32, embed, Zephyr, 
And in terms of automotive target, we also support um, Autosar Classic with Zeno um, and specifically Microsar. Uh, Zeno doesn't introduce any topological constraint. So as we have explained in the past, and I believe that this part of Zen is fairly understood, you know, Zeno doesn't force you into either you know, using only peer-to-peer -peer or only brokered uh, communication. Uh, if you take as a, as a counter example, MQTT. MQTT on one side and perhaps TDS on the other side provide you both with a publish subscribe abstraction. But, and they both, make an interpretation of PubSub, uh, assuming in the case of MQTT, that perhaps um, forcing you into a topology in which communication is always mediated by broker, it's OK. And for DDS, on the other hand, there is this assumption that every peer can communicate directly with every other peer. Zeno doesn't make any of these assumptions. And in fact, you can run on any topology. So you can do peer-to-peer -peer over a click. Uh, you can do peer-to-peer over an arbitrary mesh, which is very useful uh, on robotics application and for any application that communicates over sometimes radio links. Uh, but it's also useful when you deploy uh, your topology or our routers, the Zeno routers, which by the way are software routers, on the internet, right? You might have regions that will be more strongly connected, but then perhaps only communicating through backbones between regions. And so you really need to be able to support a generalized mesh connectivity. And that's what Zeno does. But it goes even further because to support very advanced application, we also make it possible for peers, not only to route data on behalf of other peers, but also to behave as almost infrastructural node and route data on behalf of client. So you might have, a, again, application. Um, this comes very often in mobile application with robots or, or, or autonomous vehicles in which you have um, a fleet or a, a coalition of robots uh, communicating over a mesh and then some more constrained robots that cannot afford to communicate as peer and in that case it would be client peering up with the closest peer so no topological constraint you as an architect you as a developer decide what makes sense for your deployment we have lots of plugins in the open source um, so we have plugins to databases that are used to store data that eventually as we will see square it through queryable anticipating a little bit the concept of, of the webinar and so as of today in the open source, we have a plugin for InfluxDB, RocksDB, Amazon, S3, Minio, a main memory and file system. Um, we have plugins for protocols. So today we support ROS, ROS2, HTML5, DDS, REST, MQTT, WebSocket. And uh, something that we have not, I would say, covered of, we have not communicated a lot about Xenoflow, but we also have a plugin for Xenoflow. Uh, we will be providing more information on Xenoflow during the, um, the Zeno user meeting, which, by the way, is the 12th of December at 3 p.m. Paris time. Don't miss it. Uh, it will be streamed on all social media. It's completely free, so just you know, join in and enjoy it. And by the way, if you are in the Paris area, contact us because we will uh, be hosting some people uh, in this beautiful room and having some refreshment um, um, after, after the event. So getting back to Xenoflow, we will cover more details and um, properly unveil it um, um, at a user meeting. But this is a data flow computing framework uh, that you can, for which the runtime can be plugged on any router. And as a consequence, allows you to run data flow from the cloud, uh, from the data center down to the microcontroller as you know, leveraging the Zen infrastructure. OK, in terms of latest news, I mean, why is there all of this buzz around Xeno? Well, because the protocol has solved some pretty important problems, and that's not by chance. I mean, it was done by design, right? As I've explained several times, several years ago, we decided to go back and, and try to tackle the problem of communication, uh, so for data movement, and then distributed query, um, starting from zero, leveraging all of our experience, more than 20 years of experience in protocol design, and trying to design a protocol that addresses the world and the requirement of, of application that we see today. As a consequence, you know, Zeno was one of the reasons why Zeta Scale was identified as one of the top 10 startups to watch in 2023. Again, uh, very good words expressed by Amazon in a paper earlier this year, uh, analyzing you know, the gap of the various IoT protocol and identifying how Zeno actually is the protocol that perhaps is the right way going forward. Super important for the robotics domain. Uh, you will have the links on the slides, but this report um, essentially makes a very throughout analysis 
of different protocols and their fitness in robotics. And Zeno comes on top. Uh, as a consequence, it has been selected as the first non DDS RMW for Zeno, uh, for, uh, for Ross. Um, so that's that's quite incredible for us, but more importantly, I think it's it's very interesting to understand the use case that it covers and how it really maps to end user uh, requirements. Okay, done with the intro, let's move to the code, right? That's why we are here. So let's move to the programming model. So the Zeno programming model actually is very straightforward. And I think we are still surprised um, to some extent, uh, because I mean, we've put lots of effort in making sure that the, the API is as simple and um, uh, as possible. But uh, we are still surprised by the fact that, um, you know, we keep learning about people deploying system based on Xeno that uh, we have never heard about. And uh, so, I mean, that, that's great. It seems it's easy to use and it works. So the key concept in Xeno is a resource. What is a resource is a tuple. Is a tuple composed by a key and a value. Okay, that's it. And then out of this, you have key expression, where a key expression essentially represents a set of keys. So you have different way of expressing wildcard, and this is an active area of expansion to give more expressiveness to the kind of, of sets that you can denote with a key expression. And then we have a selector. A selector is the combination of a key expression and then a series of predicate, okay? So the basic idea is that the key selector decides the set of resources that uh, you know are target of this selector. And then you have to think of the predicate as additional, um, in composition logic, additional predicates that decides you know, which element among those that satisfy the key expression belong actually to, to this selector. And uh, this is quite useful because you, know, you can use selectors to express traditional queries, to express, to express pro um, projection, to express temporal queries, and so on and so forth. We have had a webinar last year, so if you look on our YouTube channels, precisely on how to express queries and um, all of our database connectors that was done by Julian and Ox. So uh, go and look into it because I won't be looking at the periphery of Zeno, we'll be looking really at the, the API, the primitives and the core uh, feature that Zeno provides. Okay, then besides this, 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 you know, this concept, you have to familiarize yourself with the concept of a publisher. Although we'll see that uh, a publisher in Zeno is like the Phantom of the Opera, right? Um, it appears from time to time, but actually is not, as we will see, is actually not required in order to produce data. And there is a good reason for that. We'll, we'll analyze it once we go through some of the API. But the publisher in, ge in general is just a source of key values, a source of resource, okay? Uh, think of it as a spring out of which uh, sprinkle resources. Then you have a subscriber, and if you follow this watery abstraction, a subscriber is nothing but a sync for a key expression. So as a subscriber, say, hey, this is the set of key I'm interested in. Any update on resources whose key matches this expression, make sure that I get them. And then you have a queryable. And here is you know, where Zeno gets very powerful. Um, so a queryable, it's something around the network that tells, look, for anything whose key matches the, this key expression, if you come to me, I will have something for you, okay? So think of it as a well where you go, you know, if you need things that match its key expression. And we will see again, a few examples will play around with queryables. Okay, then in terms of primitives, it's the, the API is fairly, fairly small. So there are APIs to deal with sessions, so opening and closing a session. Um, opening a session is very important in Xeno because there are a few things that are negotiated. You have a chance to negotiate sequence number resolution that lowers potentially the wear overhead. Uh, we check, uh, for instance, uh, the, the ability or the possibility to use shared memory or zero copy. So there are all a bunch of things that are done during um, opening a session um, that um, allow us to set up a proper communication channel and exploit you know, perhaps a zero copy if possible, uh, if the two um, application happen to be on the same memory domain and so on and so forth. And all those things are sorted out during session opening. Then you have the declare operation. So declare key expression, declare subscriber, declare um, publisher. The only one that is required to get proper behavior is declare subscriber. Uh, and you have declare queryable and declare queryable. 
declare publisher and declare key expression are just, as we will see, mere optimizations, okay? And then in order to deal with resources, you can do put, you can do delete, you can do a pull, and you can do a get, but we will see the details of this. Okay, so before we get to some code, I want to reflect a moment on the fact that Zeno provides you with universal abstraction. Why? When you build a distributed system, you typically need to represent a data plane, a control plane, and a management plane. So the data plane, usually, you know, uh, there is data in motion and there might be data at rest. So usually you combine um, a PubSub technology with some database technology. Uh, the, um, uh, and, and that's, again, we're in the data world, right? Data at rest, data at motion. Control and management plane, besides data, they usually need to deal with coordination. And coordination usually requires triggering some services. Okay, so when you usually build a distributed system, you need some way of representing PubSub, some way of dealing with remote computation, and some way of dealing with storages. And Zen is the only protocol that has primitives that allows you to satisfy all those requirements. PubSub is trivially satisfied because we have publisher and subscriber and we support the PubSub abstraction. Remote computation, as we will see, can be expressed by queryables. And this is a pretty generalized view of remote computation, as we will see, and investigate with some live example. And then storages, a storage in the end is nothing else that's something in which I can write and I can read from. And so in Zeno, a storage is just a, a library element that we, for which we provide plugins um, that on the wire or on the network, it's represented as a subscriber. So that's the writing of an equitable. That's the reading of. Okay, that's it. And so in that respect, Zeno provides you with all the primitives that you need to build distributed system. And if you use something else, typically you will have to complement and use different uh, technologies, right, in order to achieve uh, the goal. And the other point is that the protocol has been done in such a way that all of these cases are implemented very efficiently. But, and we will see some performance at the very tail of this presentation real quickly. Okay, so let's get into some some programming API. So first things, I will do this webinar in Rust. Why Rust? Well, because at the time, it's among the language bindings that we have in in, uh, uh, in Zeno is my favorite language. Uh, because the core of Zeno is written in Rust, we, we support plenty of other programming languages. I could have done it in Python, I could have done in in, uh, in C++, but I think it's, I, I decided to do it in Rust First of all, because it's, you know, uh, the language in which we provide always new feature. So we provide new feature always in the Rust version, stabilize them, and then move to the other API. And second, because if you're not using Rust today, I think you should consider using it, um, if it makes sense in your domain, obviously. Um, and so through this webinar, perhaps, you know, I'll give you some appetite for Rust. We'll see. So in terms of API design, Zeno support both synchronous as well as asynchronous programming. And that, I mean, in the in Rust uh, concepts. Additionally, as you will see, in order to ensure availability of the API, we use builders everywhere. And uh, I will uh, show you what is the sign. We already have a hint in this slide. So whenever you do something in the Zen API, at some point, when you want to trigger something, you need to resolve, okay? So the rest that you see sometimes in our, in our example is just a shorthand for resolve. So resolve this builder and execute the operation. Okay, that's really what it means. Why builder? Because we want to make sure that uh, you can build application and on our hand, we can keep innovating and perhaps extending functionality without breaking your code. Okay, and that's the nicest way uh, of, of achieving it. Um, so builder are used anywhere. And I think whenever you want to understand whether all the different options for, for a given operation, and um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll guide you through, through the documentation, looking at the builder for whatever you're trying to do is the best approach. So you want to create a, a subscription, search for subscription builder, you will see what are the options. But again, we'll get through the documentation, I'll show you. Okay. so. Should we use sync or async? 
that's you know the the amletic dilemma there are certain i, I think that the, the, it, well typically i go for a sink if i have no other constraint uh, and why I do that? Because um, all of a sudden, I can uh, leverage things like streams. And as, as we will show you, when I do a subscriber, um, I get a stream, same things for queries, and uh, I have no inversion of control. So when I use async programming, the beautiful things is that I can do concurrent programming as if I was programming sequentially. That avoids inversion of control um, allows for the asynchronous time actually to, to deal um, and adapt to the number of cores that I have on my machine because the asynchronous time essentially creates a number of physical threads per core and then serves all the async tasks on this pool of threads. So I don't need to, to bother, to be bothered by it to some extent. Okay. And then I can avoid inversion of control. And I think inversion of control, um, makes code very hard to to read very hard to debug um and whenever you know i can use a sync api that's what i go for are there some situation where i would pick the synchronous api yes and uh, i would do that if there are some third-party libraries that are not async so in that case mixing sync and async becomes tricky and you end up having block on everywhere in your code the code gets kind of kind of ugly and if you are not careful on how to use it, you risk also uh, introducing some performance bottleneck. And the other case is if I'm interfacing like with C or C++ or building something in Xeno that then eventually has to be used from C or C++, perhaps I would still use the synchronous um, Zen API. But when in doubt, you know, reach us out on Discord. We will be more than happy to engage in a, on a discussion. So once you have done the philosophical um, discretion and decide if you want to go sync or async, how do you tell Zen or the API that you want to use? Well, simply by importing the right prelude, okay? So if you want to use sync, you just say in, in your Rust application, use Zen prelude sync column column star. If you was, want to use async, you just in, um, import the async prelude. And for those of you that are not familiar with Rust, that weird R and then pound simply means row, right? Because async is a reserved word and um, this is usually you know, uh, how you, uh, you can escape a, a, a keyboard. But at least you know that sync, that's the, the, the use statement that you have to put. And for um, async, that's what you have to do. And then the API changes just marginally because the resolve, it's there in both cases. So what I'm showing here is the act of opening a session. So you see, I do Zeno open. I create a default configurator. That's the default um, trait in Rust, by the way. And then I don't want to do anything else, right? I don't want to configure anything else on the open builder. So I resolve it. And then, well, in this case, I'm unwrapping on production code. We forbid the unwrap. So typically, you don't really want to unwrap on production code. You will want to, uh, to do an if let, for instance. And I will show some example later on. But to keep the code compact, I'm going to unwrap, which means if something bad happened, you know, this program eventually will, will fail. Again, production code don't, I mean, we forbid the use of unwrap, okay? Um, and, um, uh, and I think you should do the same. Okay, so for the async, what is the difference? Difference in use, and then after the resolve, that's an asynchronous, that's a future that you need to resolve, so you need to, to do a wait, okay? As you do in any other um, asynchronous code in Rust. So that's a reserved word, as you know, and then eventually, you know, you do either the, the deconstructing assignment, but in this case, to keep it simple, I just do an unwrap. Okay, so now we know how to open a session, and now we know how to get into the Zeno world, either from the sync or from the async world. So pick the word and uh, the door that you, that you prefer. Most of the examples that I'm going to show are using the asynchronous API, just because of what I described before. So how do you produce data without a publisher? So what I said just before is that in Xeno, technically, you don't need a publisher. A publisher is just an optimization. And so as soon as you have a session, you can start immediately putting data. And um, the declaration of a publisher is just an optimization. Um, and you should only declare a publisher if for those resources that you're going to write very frequently. For one shot, uh, publication, don't even bother. It's more simpler to code. And um, 
I mean, uh, in terms of overhead, in the end, it's, you know, uh, it's a sporadic write. Just go for a simple put. So let's look at this put. This is Rust code. And what I'm seeing is that I'm providing a key. So Zeta webinar, Zen unleashed in the time. And then I'm providing um, a string. Technically, it's a, it's a reference to an SDR for, for the Rust programmer. But for forgive me, I'll call it a string for everyone else. And then if you don't know Rust, you, you'll get the details. OK? But just for simplicity, uh, I'll, I'll make this, give me this, this license. OK? And um, so few few things are happening under the hood, right? You can provide a key this way. Under the hood, this key is being transformed into a key expression being validated. If there was a forwarding slash, you would get an error because there are no more forwarding slash uh, in, um, in the resources, but since uh, version six, I believe. And then, I mean, the question could be, oh, so as a payload, can I use only a string in Xeno? Well, let's see. OK, and let's see, because um, let's go to an editor. Or maybe no, uh, before we get that, let's let, let's remain here for a, a moment more. So getting back to the to the to the publisher, we've seen how to um, produce data from a session. If I'm going to produce to publish some data regularly, right, then I really want to create a publisher. Because what does a publisher do? Under the hood, the publisher will declare the key associated or the key expression associated with, um, uh, with the publisher. And that will make sure, for instance, that on the wire, this string will be mapped to a very small integer, which is unique between the session. Okay, So this is how Zeno keeps this famous five bytes overhead. Right? We are not sending these strings on the network if you are doing resource registration or if you are decla declaring publishers. And even if you are doing put, then in that case, we don't do any eager registration, but our router, our runtime is smart enough at some point to decide if it's going to do some generalization and all of a sudden play tricks, okay? And those tricks are always played in order to make sure that we shrink whatever it's sent on the network that is you know, meta information as opposed to actual data. So in this case, the declare of a publisher is pretty straightforward. Um, you have, again, the resolve, the await, the unwrap. And once you have a publisher, you can put straight on the publisher. So in this case, and by the way, we'll do this for real, um, we will be streaming some video from this webinar. Obviously, we are already streaming on Demio, but perhaps we should start doing webinar on Zeno. So let's see if how Zeno, I mean, how hard it is, is to, to push some video on Zeno, right? But imagine we were to do that, then in this case, we probably want to make sure that um, uh, this transmission path is optimized. And so we do declare a publisher. And then each time we are ready to write a frame, we just do a put with the, as I'll show you, the frame, resolve it, await, done. OK? So going back now for a moment with respect to what kind of data can Zeno grok? Well, technically, Zeno doesn't force any encoding on you okay so as you know there are other technology on one side like dds that are very strict they force you to define a data model they force on your serialization format they take lots of decision for you on the other hand you have mqtt that takes no decision nor gives any support and then oh, it's kind of the guy that says hey, hey, hey hold on a second i mean not too many constraints right because the application might want to use x or y uh, so, you know, it's good to have some freedom of choice and, uh, um, and free will, I think. But on the other hand, you know, uh, it's also good to be able uh, for things that are recurring, uh, like when I need to write an integer or I need to write a string or a float or a JSON to make it very easy to support it natively. And for the other case, to be able to tag the type that you're sending. So then, in fact, natively supports writing primitive types, writing JSON, and um, uh, supports, uh, provides special support for all the encoding that you see included here. Anything else that is application specific, you can specify your encoding, and that encoding is received as part of the sample. Okay, so here we have a few examples. Um, so in the first uh, put operation, actually, I was writing a string. 
So the encoding that will be received on the receiver side will be text plain, and then we'll be able to do the proper, the required transformation. Suppose that now, you know, I someone was giving a vote to this webinar, which hopefully, I hope it's five, but I was giving voting myself, or well, actually, if I was voting myself, I would never give myself five, but that's just for, for fun, right? So suppose that someone was giving a five to this webinar, um, and then in this case, 5.0, that's a float, and you can write straight a float in Xeno, okay? No need to serialize, no need to do anything special. Xeno supports that uh, primitively. Um, then you can write an integer. So suppose this is the episode of Zen Unleashed number one. Perhaps we will do a few more um, in the Unleashed series, maybe, but that's episode number one. Uh, and then when I'm writing in this case, if I'm writing as such the, the frame, right, or sending an attachment, then in this case, uh, this is an octet stream, okay? How about JSON? Well, JSON is natively supported too. So look what I'm doing here, because in reality, right um you know and that's a data model design perhaps i wouldn't want to do all this publication i wanted to publish perhaps the information of the webinar as a single json so define my json or, or get my json from somewhere and do it in a single publication right and this uh, even if i wasn't to put the encoding explicitly right it would, would have been sent it would have been appeared on the other side as an application json okay let's go and look at, look at some code now Okay, so first of all, obviously, you have the docs.rs, um, dot and you can get through this. There are two, two key points, you know, to get Zen information. Uh, Zeno.io, and you have the documentation providing already quite a bit of information, and then the Rust documentation, but in any case, you can get there from crates, right? You search from Zeno. We always publish our crates there, and uh, for Python and everyone else is the would be on PyPy or otherwise it's on uh, um, it's on the relevant uh, relevant site for the for the programming language. Okay, read the docs for instance, and we keep all the documentation with the docs. So documentation for Zen is there. You already have some example, right? So that's good. But uh, let's I have a few more here for you. Okay. So we were looking at the put, actually. Let me increase the font because I don't think this is very readable like this. Maybe this is better. So again, this is an asynchronous application. So you see my use, you see the main, you see my open, and then as putting data, okay? Putting a, a float, well, uh, putting a string, another string, yet another string, then some float, an integer, and then a vector, okay, as an octet, and that it will be recognized as an octet string. Now, we can obviously publish this data. So if I go here and I do, actually, let's do a cargo, well, let me do it from here. Right. So cargo build, it's already built but that's how you would build it. Then we go here and for instance, we do a um, target debug put. So it, it, it did the put, obviously nothing is happening because there is no subscriber. So how do we do a subscriber? So let's look at how we do a subscriber, okay? And then we'll put everything together. So when we do a subscriber, we just have to use the declare subscriber a primitive in Xeno and provide a key expression for which you know, we want to express a subscription, okay? A key expression could be something like in, in the example, the running example we have Zeta webinar Xeno unleashed slash star or Zeta webinar slash star star. The difference between a single and double star is that a single expands only to one level, right? A star star you can have arbitrary nesting. So there could be um, multiple uh, multiple slashes in between. So in this case, we are declaring a subscription for Zeta webinar slash star star, and that's it. So let's see how a subscriber looks like in real code, right? So if we go under sub, and I'll, I'll post this example, although you already have, and I will show you in the Zeno distribution, uh, plenty of example, but these are just um, you know, for the webinar to make them relevant to the webinar. So again, I create a session, as you can see, 
and then I mean I have all the annotation of types, right? Uh, this is uh, this is useful, especially when using Rust, and I always like to see my types. Um, and this is the actual declaration. Okay, declaring subscriber, resolving the builder, unwrapping, and that's it. So let's see what happens then if we start our subscriber. So if we start our subscriber here and we do again the put operation, well, we get and we get the data with the proper encoding. So just to make sure that you didn't miss it, if I go back here for a moment, in here, right, I'm writing the sample key expression, the value, and the value is being converted in the right format automatically, right, and the encoding. So let me show you again. The string, right, the text, the float, the integer. So that's very, very handy. And for the octet, obviously, that's that doesn't uh, doesn't show. OK, um, so that's very powerful because think for a moment with many other technology, what it takes for you to write an integer, right? I have a temporal sensor. I just want to write a float. How do I do that? I mean, for some technology, you have to declare a full topic, generate, I mean, too much work for my for my taste. OK, so what if we write some JSON, right? So if I put some JSON, Then on the other side, you actually get the JSON, right, with the proper encoding. And let's look again at the code. If I look at the uh, put JSON that I had crafted here, it's precisely what you could see on the slides. So no surprise, right? I just put this like yet another of the value that is natively understood by Zeno. Pretty neat. OK, so just um, to make sure that everyone understands the steps to get started. Right. If we were to start from absolute scratch, okay, what would I do, or what you should do? So no need to check out anything. I mean, assuming you have Rust installed, right? I will move here. Uh, K Labs webinar. So let's make something um, a live example. Yeah. Ah, in fact, no. Sorry, I want to do slightly differently. Uh, yeah. So I would do cargo new live example. Okay, so I will let cargo generate the, the boilerplate for me. Okay, then I would open an editor. Let me open an editor here. Go on live example and uh, look at the cargo. So if I want to use Zeno, I need to add the right dependency. So in Rust, what do I do? Well, I go on crates.io, I look at this as, ah, okay, this is the, the dependency I need to add. Good. And then something else you need to know is that for Zeno, you also need to add the dependency on async STD. So let's search async STD. So async STD is here. So let's also add this one. And by the way, there are some additional features that are required. So actually, let me take the right line from here. Because we use some advanced feature from, uh, from async. Yeah, so let's do it this way, OK? And uh, essentially, that is it, OK? Now, let's go under under the source. So let's do a, an asynchronous application. So use, and we said it's Zeno. Then we get into the prelude, right? And then uh, recall the escape to escape async. So we draw async, and then star, star. It's an asynchronous main, so we need to put an annotation, so async std main and then let's transform this main in asynchronous and essentially we are done and now if we want to open a session let zeno equal oops open config and that's it okay rest and then you would do the await and then wrap just for the for this example that's it okay this is precisely uh, all the code you need to write to get started with zen so pretty straightforward and these are the steps and once you have a session as we just saw uh, you can start um, uh, already publishing you can get a subscriber and so on and so forth so these are really the step uh, you know three very simple steps to get started with oh 
this is not stuff star this is star <laughs> too much to have been reading too many writing too many uh, zenoki expressions okay so that's that's pretty much it so let's get back to our slides we'll be bouncing from slides to code and vice versa and let's look at something else so i don't know if you spotted it but the subscriber was actually iterating through the samples received by the by the by the by the producer okay and in fact in the subscriber the subscription so the subscriber itself is a stream and it's a stream that will contain all the uh, samples uh, whose key match my subscription ex expression and so the, one of the reasons why I like to use the asynchronous API is that it makes it efficient and very elegant to write you know, concurrent code as if it was sequential. So in this case, and, and the indentation got for some reason a little bit messed up, but in this case, you see that you know I'm actually doing a couple of things, right? Um, so while the stream, while I have a subscription, right, um, I'm doing a deconstructive assignment. So I'm, I asked to receive asynchronously data. I await for it. And uh, uh, if the result is OK, so if there is no error, then I get the sample. And then I'm printing the sample. And as the subscription is a stream, all of a sudden, you can use higher order programming and the stream combinators. So for instance, you know, suppose that I wanted to transform this stream from a stream of sample to a stream of tuples uh, that were key, expression, and value. Well, this is the, I would do this with a map operation, right? So I would do a, a map into the stream of, um, of samples. And then eventually for each valid sample, I would transform this into some tuple key expression value, otherwise known. And there I could do a filter to, for instance, just get the, um, a filter and a flatten potentially to just get out a, a, a stream that is giving me the key and the value. And all those comp composition will work asynchronously. So all of a sudden, I can fit this to you know, some business logic that is just expecting to receive you know, the updated from key expression and value. And it's, it's super powerful. So this is why um, you know, I really favor the asynchronous API um, in Rust, because all of a sudden, you can use all the power of these combinators. And for, especially for those of you used to functional programming, you, know, you can get very creative and very compositional. Okay, so query and queryable. So PubSub, everyone understands, right? And then you get to the query. And most of the people, you know, get started with Zeno using PubSub. They like our PubSub because it's simple, it's performant, it's very flexible. And then one day they step on a queryable and they say, hey, what is that, a queryable? So, I mean, actually a queryable is something pretty simple but unusual to some. And I think it's just the fact that you have never seen one before that sometimes creates some, um, um, you know, uh, some curiosity or some, some, some questions. So a queryable is nothing else than a network endpoint that answer queries that match its key expression. That's it, okay? And it provides an answer to a query by means of a finite, stream of key value or a finite stream of samples. So conceptually, a subscription gives you a handle to an infinite stream. You don't know if that stream will ever end, right? Um, you might decide to activate, deactivate your subscription, but conceptually, if we think you know, conceptually, that stream is infinite. Whenever you do a query, right, there is someone on the other side of the network, perhaps, or you know, by you, that answer to that query, or perhaps multiple applications, right? Multiple queryable that answer to the query with a sequence, a finite sequence of um, key values. Now, queryables are very powerful, as I will show you, and can be used to represent both reading out of a data store for a database as well as triggering computations. How do you declare a queryable? So, you declare a queryable simply by using the declare queryable primitive providing um, a key expression. And then whenever you declare a queryable, you need to define if is this queryable is complete or not, okay? And completeness, the intuition of completeness is the following. So if a queryable has answers for all the query 
that are strictly a subset of its key expression, then it's complete. If he assumes that he has some gaps, okay, you can visualize those as holes, as I will show you, right? Uh, then is not complete. That's the concept of completeness in Zen. And I will try to visualize it, okay? So one way of thinking of complete is like a cheese that has no holes, okay? You have a slice of cheese with no holes, and something that is not complete is like a slice of Emmental. You have full of holes, right? And so the, 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 the set, if you, if you may, this cheese analogy, the slice of cheese, right, is the set of all the keys represented by your key expression. And uh, the fact of having holes, it means that within that set, for certain su subset, you don't have answer, okay? Um, and so that's the concept of incomplete. Uh, why is there? It's useful for the time being, trust me, okay? I'll give you some hint, but uh, we already, you know, they, they, there are lots of concepts to be to be to be covered. I'll give you some some hints on why this is useful, and we'll see that. One of the hints that I can give you is that if you want to implement quorums, uh, whenever you do a read quorum, you better go and have in your quorum complete um, queryables. Okay, um, but I will I will pause there and not necessarily go any further in discussing quorums. So, how do you trigger queryables? You trigger queryables with query. And the operation that express a query in Zeno is called a get. Um, so, in the very first version of Zeno, it was actually called query. And then we call it get um, to actually align it also to the concept of RESTful operations. And because even when you use an HTTP request with our um, REST API, you actually do an HTTP GET, okay? So that works nicely across all APIs, and it's a concept that kind of people uh, understand. So in, when in there you issue a, a GET operation, right, you pass a key expression, so that's the set of keys or the set of resources, right, identified um, that, that matches this key for which I want to get values. And then you can further refine by providing a query target that controls who among the match, matching um, queryables are eligible and the consolidation policy that controls how the replies are consolidated, okay? The result of this uh, query is a finite stream of reply, as you see in this slide, where each reply is a sample and a reply ID. So you can control the reply ID and you can know from where this reply is coming, okay? So, what is the query target? So there are four different query targets. Best matching, and I will demonstrate it with some example, but the best matching, before animation, then a code example. The best matching essentially Zeno looks around and it tries to figure out what is the storage that in conceptually covers your query and it's closer, okay? So if we can find a complete storage, then it will interrogate the complete storage with respect to your query that is the closest to you Otherwise, it will decide on an intersection of, um, you know, storage that are not necessarily uh, covering your query. Then you have all, so you can trigger all the queryable that match your key expression or the get key expression, all complete or complete n. Okay, so all complete it means all the, the queryable that are complete with respect to their key expression, and complete n is among all uh, the the complete storages pick n. And those ends should be, you know, typically the, the end that are closer to me. Once again, teaser for you, this complete end is very useful for read quorums, okay? So once again, you see the idea of complete quorums, replication, and so on and so forth. So, but let's try to visualize already this idea of query target. So imagine that this application here is issuing a query for, you know, get zeta slash webinar slash zeno slash star, best matching. So in this case, Zeno will see that there is a complete storage and an incomplete storage. The incomplete storage is closer, but the complete storage you know, completely covers this query. So it will route the query there. The query will be triggered, okay? And eventually the result will be provided by the peer. Imagine now this client here is issuing exactly the same query. So in this case, perhaps Zeno will decide to route the query here, okay? Now suppose that now the target is all. Now, in this case, you are asking really to trigger all the queryables that match my key expression. So you see that only the queryables on the 
top left and bottom right corner um, that are that have as key expression zeta news star star are not triggered because there is no intersection between the keys. Okay. You could ask the all complete. So in this case, the non complete storages recall the mental or the non complete queryable. Sorry, the mental queryables won't be triggered, and you can ask for complete n. So in this case, I'm asking for two. Uh, only two will be triggered. Okay, so that's the intuition of the query target. How about consolidation? Well, consolidation helps you controlling in the routing path how samples for the same key are consolidated. Okay, so the default is known. So we don't do any consolidation. You get everything and you decide how to do and if to do consolidation because you know in some application it makes sense in some other it doesn't then we have monotonic which means across any routing path we make sure that for any key value right older um, samples will not be um, uh, forwarded okay so if there are three queryable uh, on this given routing path responding both for the for the kifu right at some point only the newest sample will be forwarded and not the other. But that doesn't forbid that if there are multiple storages or multiple queryables on multiple routing paths, that you still receive monotonically from each of those, but not necessarily from the different routing path. You still need to do some further um, uh, consolidation on your side, depending on the application. And then you might have the latest that makes sure that for every key, you really get the latest value. Okay, so there is some additional consolidation, and as you can imagine, that requires some store and forward behavior in our routing infrastructure. Okay, let's look now into QoS, because this is one of the questions that we get very often, and so especially some people that are used to technology like DDS say, hey, DDS has one zillion QoS, where are Xeno QoS? And the point is that in Xeno, the approach was slightly different. So let me give you a few examples before getting into some of the things that you can really tune. Things like partitions, right? In Xeno, you have the resource structure, the key expression. That's how you organize your data. So it's very natural. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to to to, to use this this complex idea of uh, DDS partition to deal with it. Uh, other things, um, and by the way, th th perhaps we should do um, a full webinar, and we have slides on mapping QoS. Perhaps I will I will post those. I believe I posted those on Discord already before. If you look in our support channel, I think there are slides that I posted that, that show a comparison um, side by side. But anyway, there are all a bunch of things that Zeno does automatically or that does um, without you having to request explicitly. For the things that require control from you, then reliability, okay? So reliability in Zeno is controlled by the subscriber. The publisher publishes data and is the subscriber that decides if it wants to receive data reliably on a best effort manner. Okay. And you do that when declaring the subscriber. So why so? Because I mean we find it strange for uh, for a publisher to decide how you should consume the data that I'm producing. To some people, what I'm saying is very important. They don't want to miss anything. To some other, you know. It's okay, important, and if they have a gap from time to time, no problem at all, okay? Then another aspect, which is orthogonal to reliability, but has to do with some issues in distributed system, right? In distributed system, you have a problem with reliability and progress and infinite memory. So if you want to make sure that you are reliable, then uh, in an asynchronous system, you have to give up either progress or assume that you have infinite memory, okay? But Many in many cases, actually, you cannot give up progress and you don't have infinite amount of memory. So after some time, or whenever you detect congestion, especially for recovering for, from congestion, you want to be able to shed loads, load. But in some other cases, you just shouldn't shed load. You should really make sure that whatever you have produced eventually finds its way to the consumers. So this is congestion control. Congestion control is controlled by the producer, and whenever you do a put, you can provide a congestion control that is either block, which means, hey, if this has to block because of congestion, that's okay. You know, I understand the consequences. I have no problem with it, but this is some kind of information that you cannot just drop because of congestion on the network. On the other side, right, um, if, if, if it's something that can be dropped when in congestion, then you should use the congestion control drop. 
And you can actually do this uh, either on a publisher level or for every put. So let me give you an example of when I would use this. Suppose I'm doing video streaming, right? Depending on the encoding, there are certain frames that are key, like in MPEG RDI frames. Those nobody should ever lose. And so I could send my entire video reliably, for, for instance, or all the subscriber could be reliable, potentially, right? Um, and then I could use congestion control to make sure that all the, 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 the incremental frames are dropped if I detect congestion. So that could be you know, one interesting approach that allow us to, uh, to drop samples and have kind of best effort behavior in presence of um, uh, network overload, but otherwise guaranteeing kind of the best, the best quality. And then there is something else. Then also support data prioritization. And we really, we really do priority-based scheduling. So we have seven different levels of priority. And again, you can define the priority for either at the publication, uh, the publisher declaration time, or when actually producing some data. And you just use you know, the dot priority on the put. So I mentioned before the builder, right? So let me go back for a moment to the Zeno documentation. So I want to show again the I don't want to leverage the cache. I just want to show you know, to get there. That's one way. And so here, for instance, if it's a um, put builder, look, here we go. Put builder. I told you, we use systematically builders for everything. So any operation, you search the operation of builder, or you only search for builder, and you find everything else. Then you will see here right that uh, you can uh, only put you can have the encoding you can have the congestion control you can have the priority and you see all the things that are provided um the allowed destinations so there are all the sort of things that, that you can control the kind and so on and so forth okay so whenever you want to see so for instance if we want to see for a subscribe um subscriber builder here we go so here you have an example right of the available options but then in the full documentation, you will see all the things that you can set uh, as option through the builder, okay? Okay, let's go back for a moment to slides. And let's do the liveliness and then I will show you, you know, some, some, some other, oh no, actually I want, before getting to liveliness, I want to show you something on Quetables, okay? So, whoops, because we saw the animation, but it's good to see how to, to do it with code. So in this case, I'm using uh, three queryables, right? Uh, that are started, comp to, the green is complete. You see the option here, complete, and this is the keys, Zeta webinar, and the value that will return, this is from the Zeno distribution, is just green. Here we return white, and this one, Actually, the red one is not complete. Okay, so if I do a query here with default, the default is best matching. So then we'll pick up one, right? In this case, it decided to pick the green. It liked it better, but it could have picked equally the white queryable, and it returns me just uh, triggers only that queryable and gives me back the result. I could say uh, to trigger all of them. Okay, in this case, you see the query is triggered on all the queryables and I receive all the data. I could ask for all complete. In this case, the query is routed only to the two complete queryables. And again, a queryable is just something that answers queries. Whether this something triggers a computation, goes and read um, or access a databases, I mean, you decide what to do. But you also see the power, I mean, if you think about RPC, RPC is client server and you are bound to the address of the server. Here, it's completely location transparent, right? I'm naming something I'm interested in, and then I can decide uh, in a very fine granular manner how to address or how to trigger the, the, the queryable that can answer that query, okay? So let me now go back to liveliness. We are going to overrun a, a little bit, sorry for that. But I always pack a lot of things in the in the webinars. Liveliness, you might not be familiar with this feature. That's a new feature in Zeno. It has been around for a few months. Uh, you have the RFC uh, listed at the bottom of the page. And if you want to use it, 
you have to build a Xeno with enabling a stable feature. I think we'll be stabilizing uh, this feature as of the next release. Just for you to know, when something is unstable in Xeno, it means that the API hasn't been um, you know, finalized. In our process, usually, for every innovation, we mark the innovations as unstable, try to gather community feedback on the, on the feature, on the API, and once we and the community is happy, we just stabilize it, similar to what the Rust, uh, the Rust ecosystem does. So what is Xeno liveliness? So application, this is application often need to do group management. And even if they don't have requirement of group management, for which, as you know, we have proper abstraction in Xeno X, you need to, to be aware of liveness of things that are around you. And very often, these features are either built in, in the protocol for everything, like in DTS, and, it, and then struggle to scale, or inexistent, like in MQTT. And then you have to build it on top. And as soon as you build it on top, there is nothing you can optimize, right? And so that's kind of a pity. So what we've done in Xenon is to give you the ability of getting you know, liveliness and making it scalable. So it's a concept that we support natively in the protocol. Our routers understand this. And so we can do lots of aggregation. And so light, liveliness is very lightweight. And there is a specific API. So the basic idea is that you can declare a liveliness token for a key expression. So for instance, in, I will make an example with x men In this case, it's Wolverine that says, hey guys, I'm alive and kicking, okay? So to do that, I do Z of liveliness, declare token x men Wolverine, and then done, okay? And if I'm interested to know who are, you know, the what what is the, 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 the what is happening in the liveness token related to the X-Men, then I can create a, a, a liveness subscriber once again with a Xeno session. I do dot liveness and then declare subscriber, and I provide a, um, a, a key expression. So in this case, I'm interested in the liveliness of all the X-Men, right? And in this case, I will be receiving. A uh, sample put to indicate a new liveness token addition, so consider it a member join, or sample delete when a, a token has been disposed. But the nice thing is that Xeno has query. So suppose I want to see which X-Men are still around. I can issue a query on uh, you know using the escape dollar um, uh, ampersand slash liveliness and then my liveliness token. And this is how actually I can see who is around. So let's see this in action because it's very cool. So actually, I had it on this shell. Okay, so what I'm going to do, let's clean up a little bit this, this shell from here. So I'm going to start an application that registers a liveliness token under X-Men Wolverine. Okay, so he has done it. Then I'm going to start the subscriber. So the subscriber has just started. So there is no change in the system with respect to liveliness. I don't receive any liveliness event. And right now, if I query right, the status of the live, liveliness token or the liveliness expression uh, X-Men star, I see that there is only Wolverine around. OK? Now, let's get in Professor X. And you see that I get a liveness token update saying, hey, there is a new alive token. And obviously, if I do a query, now I see that there is Wolverine and Professor X. And I mean, uh, obviously, we couldn't be, it couldn't be a real demo without Magneto. So Magneto comes, comes also around. You get informed uh, that new liveness token has been asserted. And if I do a query, uh, there is Magneto. Now, what if I undeclare my liveness token? So if this liveness token is undeclared, right, um, you will get a notification that is not there. So look, and then if I close my application, right, it's gone. So it's no more in the group. And if I do, again, a query, it's no more there. So this is the mechanism that we provide which is very scalable because it has wire protocol support, it has infrastructure support, and uh, allows you uh, to, to be very creative. Uh, for those of you that are in the robotics world, 
this is um, how in the Rostu Bridge that um, Julian will present uh, next week, uh, we do lots of the magic related to the um, to mapping some of ROS features and uh, making sure that we have a, a very nice integration and scalable integration with ROS. Anyway, getting back to our slides, perhaps there is one more thing that I want to show because I mentioned video and I didn't show you the video, right? So we still have a subscriber here. So let me start this application, which is just an application uh, displaying video. And here we have the regular subscriber. And then we have the, the publisher for the video. Let me show you the code. The publisher for the video is this one. So this application gets the camera ID and these are a few utils, okay? This, this, simple, um, this is a simple application based on OpenCV. You open a session, you declare a publisher, priority real time, congestion drop in this case, and then I capture a frame um, and then we simply put the frame by transforming into a vector. I could have annotated it as an MPEG because I'm encoding MPEG, but I didn't even bother, okay? Um, and by the way, if you add the MPEG encoding, the advantage is that if you have then a web application using Xeno, it will know that that's an MPEG, you can show it on the web page. Pretty cool. So it will come with the right MIME um, uh, attachment. So if we start this, I start publishing video. Oh, it took, hold on. It took the same camera as that one. So actually, let me stop this. I want to take another camera. So let me close this application. I think if I do, um, and usually if you want to list the camera available on your, on your system, you can use the FMPEG. Okay, so in this case, oh, but I need to start also here the display. It's already, yeah, you see from my mobile, right? Here we go. Hello. So that's using now my, my mobile camera, okay? And uh, streaming in real time video with a couple of lines of code. And obviously the, the subscriber here is also receiving the data. And you see that as I didn't provide any explicitly because I'm passing a, just a, an octet stream, any, uh, MIME type is interpreting as, as an octet stream. Um, I would have, you know, on theory, I would have provided it with, uh, with uh, as I'm encoding as, as JPEG, with a JPEG uh, um, MIME type, which is supported by Zen. Okay, let's quickly look about performance because, I mean, this is something very well known in the community, but if you are you know, coming fresh to Zeno, it's good to know that it performs quite well. Uh, this is um, uh, available also, or this is extracted from a blog contributed by NTU, where they compared Zeno with DDS, MQTT, and Kafka. And you have in light blue, Zeno peer-to-peer, -peer. in violet, Zeno with a broker. Then this other blue is DDS. And then green is MQTT, red is Kafka. And the scale of, of the y-axis is logarithmic. So what you can see here is that um, um, you know, in terms of throughput, we are very close to 70 gigabit per second, which is the limit that gets iperf on this 100 gigabit per net uh, per second uh, network. And um, um, Zeno peer to peer uh, is obviously the one that delivers the highest throughput. Next, you have uh, Zeno uh, with a router in the middle, so it will be a publisher, a router, and then a subscriber, and everything else is below by quite a bit. And even in terms of latency. There is a trade-off between latency and throughput, right? Uh, we do some quite advanced scheduling to achieve this throughput, but that doesn't necessarily jeopardize our latency because it's still quite good. And um, I didn't have the time to, to talk about it this, this time, perhaps in the next deep dive, but we have just made available some real-time extension um, and uh, some low latency extension. So let me just show you real quickly as we wrap up how to get there on zeno.io. If you go on our blog, I mean, we regularly post um, you know, blogs for sure each time there is a release, but you might want to look at the support for ultra low latency because there are some interesting changes that uh, we've started um, rolling in and this already you know, reduces, further reduces the latency and you know, give us very low latency and still very high throughput. So that's, that's quite nice. You have the kind of best of both, of both worlds. 
So getting back to our um, slides and wrapping up. So Zeno is innovating at fast pace. Um, I mean, we are very open uh, to adding new feature to the protocol. I mean, we try to keep our ear, I mean, we have two ears, so we try to listen at least twice then how much we speak. We listen to the community. I mean, we always have, you know, too many ideas for innovation, more than, than we can implement usually, but there are a few other neat things coming up. Um, feel free to ask for features. Uh, again, the best way is either, you know, uh, an issue on, um, on GitHub, or if you want it to be a little bit more interactive and discuss in an interactive manner before posting the issue, reach us out on Discord. The community is growing. And um, it's incredible how fast the Zeno community is growing. Um, that, that's, that's great. And uh, it's expanding well beyond robotics and automotive. You know, we have more and more application in uh, edge computing, in IoT, uh, distributed gaming, and so on and so forth. I think there is growing awareness of some of the uniqueness of Zeno. And the parallel I make is that usually people see the tip of the iceberg. So they, they find Zeno as a super cool pub sub, simple to use, very performant, and then they discover the full power of Zeno. And it's like from cool to wow, okay? Uh, and I think more and more people are starting to understand the depth of Zeno. And I think you don't need to understand everything immediately, but once you're able to leave re-leverage, not just the pub sub, but also the queryable, it gets very, very powerful, okay? And so if you like Zeno, if you love Zeno as we do, if you are a fan of this you know, cool blue dragon, just help us spreading the word and uh, you know, making sure that we can build some pretty cool and great open source technology. Thank you, everyone. I think at this point we'll be taking questions. And uh, don't worry for those of you that need to drop. I know we overrun. Um, as I said, there was quite a bit of material, but uh, all the questions will be included in the recording. And if you have a question, drop it now. Uh, if you are not online, we'll, um, we'll follow up on, on email. And once again, feel free to reach me or any of the team member um, through Discord. So let me pause the screen sharing. And let me move to the chat. Okay, where are the Zen examples? So let me go back to, to screen sharing. And in fact, let me do like this. Let me move this one like this. So let me go back on share mode and I want to show a few, few things. So I will show you for Rust, but once again, the same is true for all the programming languages. So when you're getting started with Rust, so let me reduce the resolution, otherwise we'll get lost. So we try to provide a consistent set of examples for all programming languages. So for instance, here on, um, uh, on Rust, uh, under the examples directory, we have one example for each feature that is available in Zen. So for instance, to, to demonstrate the liveliness, I was using the liveliness, this one, and the liveliness subscriber, okay? the all the all the the demo have a, a minus h or minus minus help option so for instance if you do target uh, the bug because i build the bug uh, you will get the help right uh, and that's true for all of our example and for c python for any programming language we always have the same consistent set of example so that even if you learn Zeno in, you know, in Python, and you know how to do a get in Python, and you want to move to Rust, then you, know, you will have the equivalent example that behaves like a Rosetta Stone. That's the idea, right? You have exactly the same example on all programming languages. You know one, you look the example for, I don't know, you're familiar with Python, you want to show to do in C++, it's really our example can be used as a Rosetta Stone. So there is there was another question asking about the license. So Zeno is actually an Eclipse project, and so as of today, it's licensed uh, dual licensed. So EPL Eclipse Public License and Apache Two. And by memory, there was 
and other questions on um, um, on the performance. So the the blog is available here. So if you go through, um, yeah, this is the blog that was contributed. All the information in the source code is available there. And we will post indeed the code with the example that I went through, okay? I think that's it. So let me just quickly double check if there is anything more. Okay, so concerning the example of the video streaming, yes, I can share the, the, the there are two ways of getting the link. And in fact, let me show you something else. Uh, let me share again my screen. So I think my, my example is a little bit more didactical, okay? But um, uh, otherwise, if you go on GitHub, uh, Eclipse Zeno, and then you go under Zeno demo, there are all a bunch of demos, demos on ROS2. Uh, you can see how to do a distributed web with Zen. I mean, lots of very cool examples. By the way, we have support for Android. We have recently re released a Kotlin API. So all of that is there. But if you want to do video streaming, then you can go here, you go under Zcam, and you have the same application implemented in uh, Python, in REST, and in Rust. And for Rust, you have the capture and the display. I will also make available my code because my code, I, I mean, if you're starting with Zen, I think it's a little bit more user friendly or perhaps, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just do a pull request on some refactoring of, of the, of the capture to just to make it easier uh, to follow the Zeno code and separate the, the, the OpenCV specific code, but it's pretty straightforward to do. But in any case, if you want to try, you can try it immediately. Uh, and this is the code. So in general, it is Zeno demo. Let me put this here. And concerning the question from, uh, so there was another question on ROS2. So publisher latching in ROS2, um, on ROS. So I believe with the new uh, bridge, the, 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 the ROS2 bridge that we just released, all ROS2 features are supported, um, but uh, that will be a good question to ask to Julien next week in his ROS2 webinar, okay? I don't see any other questions. So I hope that this was uh, useful, interesting as usual. Uh, feel free to share your comment and uh, I look forward to seeing you on our upcoming webinar. And well, even before that, I look forward to seeing you at the Zeta user meeting. Maybe, Daniela, we can share the link of the Zeta user meeting in, in this chat uh, so that people that um, have not seen it yet, they can see the announcement, see the agenda, uh, and um, you know, uh, plan, plan to join, book in the agenda. That said, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.